So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all, and uh, allow me at the outset to thank you very much uh, for your presence here this morning and for coming for this briefing. Um, I have pleasure in introducing those who are with me here on the podium this morning, uh, namely immediately to my right, Mr. Sumitra Dutra, Dutta, who is the co-editor of the Global Innovation Index and the founding dean of the Johnson's College of Business at Cornell University. And Cornell University is one of the, as I said, co-publishers of the Global Innovation Index. On my left is Mr. Bruno Lanvin, uh, from, who is uh, also one of the founders and uh, partners, main partners and publishers, co-publishers, of the uh, Global Innovation Index through the INSEAD uh, Business School um, with its global presence. Uh, on my far right, uh, we have Mr. Volker Stuck, who is a principal and a leading innovation practitioner with PwC. Uh, and on my far left, we have Mr. Norshad Forbes, who is the immediate past president of the Confederation of Indian Industry and co-chairman of uh, Forbes Marshall. Uh, and these are amongst our knowledge partners and we're very grateful for the support uh, given by all of our knowledge partners. Uh, if I may, a final word, I have here several colleagues who are hidden somewhere about, uh, but most notably, uh, Mr. Carsten Fink, who is our chief economist and under whose auspices the WIPO contribution to the Global Innovation Index was done. Mr. Sasha von Vincent, a co-editor, uh, who works with Carsten Fink, a co-editor of uh, the Global Innovation Index. Naresh Prasad uh, is there, and Linda Lloyd, uh, our Chief of Staff, Assistant Director General, our Director of Communications, Samar Shamoon, also uh, from Communications. So, thank you all for your presence. Uh, I wanted to make just a few introductory reports. Why do we do this? Uh, we do this to attempt to measure the capacity and performance in, in the field of innovation of countries around the world. Uh, so their innovation capacity and performance. Uh, why would we bother to do that? Well, four reasons very briefly. Uh, it's been conventional wisdom for a long time now that innovation is uh, a major, if not the major, contributor to economic growth, and we are living in a world which has experienced a prolonged period of sluggish economic growth, uh, and uh, we would like to see how, of course, we can improve our economic performance, and innovation is a key to that. Secondly, as the theme for this year's Global Innovation Index indicates, <coughs> innovation is the major means by which we are able to address the, unfortunately, many global challenges that confront uh, our society. One of those is feeding a growing population uh, with competing uh, uses of land. Uh, uh, and so the theme this year is feeding uh, uh, the world um, through innovation. Uh, innovation is the way in which we do things differently. Uh, if we do things in exactly the same way, we will confront the same challenges. So it's a major pathway to addressing social challenges. Thirdly, innovation is a measure of the capacity of a country to compete. So it is directly related to the competitive capacity of any country uh, and finally, uh, innovation and technology are great differentiators in this world of enormous asymmetries. So measuring countries' capacity and providing information to countries on those areas in which we consider that uh, improve, in performance could be improved or capacity could be improved or policies could be shifted gives a pathway for countries to be able to address the differences that arise from uh, different innovation capacity around the world. Uh, it's a long-term game, innovation, of course. Uh, my colleagues will say a few words about the rankings uh, annually. We generally are interested in tendencies 
in the rankings rather than changes in one particular year. But I must congratulate Ambassador Selviger, Selviger, excuse me for massacring your name, uh, uh, of Switzerland uh, as Switzerland comes out on top for the seventh year in a row, and that is certainly a tendency. So congratulations, Ambassador, uh, on this performance. Uh, there are other movements that my colleagues will point to uh, in respect of the rankings that we can see. Uh, and overall, while there is great stability in the top 20, uh, overall we can see that innovation is becoming more multipolar. And there are individual movements that give a clear indication of this growing multipolarity uh, in respect of innovation. Individual performances, uh, there are many that we could note, and my colleagues will note some of them, uh, but uh, there are some very, very encouraging uh, differences that have emerged. A final word from me is just to say that, of course, an index tends to have a favourable effect for small and homogenous economies in which even performance is perhaps easier than in a large and diverse economy uh, with more asymmetries. Uh, and one can think of many examples, United States, China, India, as examples of very large and very diverse economies and index measures even the performance across the whole of an economy. For that reason, we started an exercise at WIPO to explore clusters, innovation clusters, uh, that uh, they are geographical localities that are not countries. Uh, I would just like to say that this exercise is very much in its early stages. It's based on a much more limited set of data than the Global Innovation Index, which is based on uh, a very, very wide number of data sets. It's based on patent data only, but it does uh, give some interesting results in identifying clusters uh, most notably coming out on top, Tokyo, Yokohama, followed by Shenzhen, Hong Kong, followed by San Jose, San Francisco, Seoul, Osaka, Kyoto. Uh, so that's an exercise that will continue uh, in the future and we will try to add other data sets to make it more interesting. But let's go back to the Global Innovation Index and the measurement of countries' performance in capacity uh, and innovation across wide data sets. Uh, and I would uh, have pleasure in uh, introducing Sumitra Dutta, the co-editor uh, and of the GII, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Francis, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving, giving us your time today. I would like to begin by offering a personal thanks to Francis because without his support and collaboration, I think this partnership would not have achieved what we've achieved in the last 10 years. Uh, we have a set of slides that seems to have disappeared from the screen, but it's back once again. That's great. And my colleagues from Cornell, Raphael out here and Jordan sitting in front would help me go through the slide. Jordan, can I, sorry, Raphael, can I have the next slide, please? So this is the 10th anniversary edition of the report. And will you please to walk you through some overall trends that we have identified in the last 10 years. And my colleague Bruno will walk through some of the details of the results from this year. Next slide, please. So over the last 10 years, we have been fortunate to have collected a set of data that I think is unique in the world of innovation. It really captures innovation in a broad-based approach. The whole logic of creating the Global Innovation Index 10 years ago was to reflect the broad-based capability of innovation in any economy. Of course, patenting is very important visible indicator of innovation, but a lot of innovation economies goes without patents, often happens 
without the support of PhDs and research scientists. And what we hope to do in this Global Innovation Index framework is really try and capture the totality of innovation happening in the economy to the best of our ability. And what we have right now is an index and a model that has proven to be a very successful and at the same time a very useful aid for policymakers and decision makers in governments, in private corporations looking to choose across different investment locations. And we hope that this kind of an analysis will <coughs> continue to support decision leaders in the future. Next slide, please. We had to come up with a framework for innovation to even answer the question, what does innovation actually mean? If a country wants to improve its innovation capacity, innovation performance, what are the various elements it should focus on? The basic idea really in the framework is to say that there are elements that form the inputs into this equation, elements that a country has to focus on to improve and to enable its various innovation actors to perform properly, and there are elements that, which are actual outputs of being successful innovation performance. So if you look at the left-hand side of this graph, and I'm not completely sure it's fully legible for you, but the details are there in the report. If you're interested, look at the details. We have five pillars out there, <coughs> one around institutions, the second around human capital and research, the third around infrastructure, the fourth on market sophistication, the fifth on business sophistication. So these are the five input pillars. And these five input pillars are further broken down into sub-pillars or sub-components. And each of the sub-components is measured by a set of variables. On the outputs, which are the right two pillars, we look at the knowledge and technology outputs, and we look at the creative outputs. And again, they are broken down into sub-components and variables. In total, there are 81 variables that go into the composition of the overall Global Innovation Index score. A few points to highlight out here. Of course, it does include the traditional metrics for innovation around patents and scientists and PhDs and so on. Those are completely in the model. But what is also interesting is, in the model, we include other elements which perhaps are not traditionally include innovations. So for example, in the element of market sophistication, we do look at the traditional element of venture capital investments. That is fairly traditional, look at that. At the same time, we also look at microfinance. Why? Because we do believe microfinance is an important element of investment in grassroots innovation in various economies. We look at infrastructure. The third pillar out there, we look at elements of the ICT infrastructure, very important. We all know it's important. Yet at the same time, we look at the ecological sustainability of that. Why? Because we do believe that ecological sustainability is critical to enable sustainable innovation investments in the economy. If you look at the outputs, traditionally the knowledge outputs, patenting, research publications, they are there in the knowledge technology outputs. Yet at the same time, we do believe the creative services sector is important. Movies, other kinds of creative elements are elements of innovation and economy. And we also have in that one important subcomponent on online creativity. We do believe that citizens, individuals do create and create content. And that is also an important part of innovation that is being expressed in the economy. So we try and include, have a holistic notion of innovation out here, and that all feeds into the Innovation Index framework. The next slide, please. Now, this is a collaborative exercise, as I mentioned earlier. And over the years, we have benefited from the support of a number of partners. And of course, this year, the partners, besides uh, co-publishers of WIPO and Cornell and INSEAD, include CII from India, Strategy Ann and PwC, and Sebrae and CNI from Brazil. We also have the benefit of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission 
that does a very valuable audit of the results for us. Next slide, please. Now, an overall result that we find, which is of some concern over the years, really is, of course, as expected in the 2009 crisis, we saw a big dip in R&D investments across the world. But that dip has we have recovered from it to some degree. But as the graph out here shows, we haven't recovered to the levels prior to the crisis. And what is more disturbing is that in recent years, especially over the last year, we have seen a tendency of some of these R&D investment growth rates decline. Now, this is of some concern, especially given the fact that the general sense of optimism today in the world about growth rates rising once again. But will these growth rate increases be sustainable if the proportional associated R&D investments do not actually increase? And I think that's an element of concern for us that we should be worried about in the future. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at the innovation trends over the last 10 years, as I mentioned at the start, we have the benefit of having a very unique database out here. We see some trends which are interesting. So one element that we see is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of investments in R&D has to increase in economies around the world, both rich countries and emerging economies. We also see that there is an innovation divide that has been there for some time and that continues to exist. So the countries at the top of the rankings, they are persistent in their position. There might be some shifts out there, but there is a strong legacy out there. And there is a divide between them and other economies that are perhaps doing still well, but not as well as them. Now, of course, in that scenario, there are a few countries that stand out. So this year, for example, China, which has been rising steadily, moves from 25 last year, 22nd this year. It's a remarkable performance by a large economy. India is also doing well. It's moved up in a position number 60 this year and is doing very well in the same income category. And what we're observing is that, in general, there are parts of the world that are moving faster than others in closing the gap. So an interesting question out here, which we all have to think about, is how can emerging economies really catch up? What are the kind of investment policies that can help them to close the gap? Because closing the gap, which is possible to be done, as shown by some economies, is an important priority for the entire world ahead of us. Now, what we also see is, if we look at the quality of innovation, and we take a subset of the variables along publications, patenting, and the university quality, you start seeing some interesting trends about countries, both high income and the middle income, that are doing better than others. And of course, what is of interest in the middle income economies is that China, India, and a few other BRIC countries do much better than others on those quality of innovation. So it's important for us to focus on quality of innovation. We also see that there's some good trends in terms of the innovation capacity and results rising in, a, in parts of the world where there was some concern earlier, specifically in Africa. So we see some countries in Africa performing better than others at the same income levels. And we see a general trend of Africa rising. And this does not mean that the gap is closed, but it does mean that there is progress in the continent that actually we should be recognizing and being proud of. And with that, I think I pass on to my colleague Bruno. Thank you, Sumitra. Um, so let me highlight some of the, the quantitative results of this year's report, GII 2017, um, the, uh, starting with the, uh, with the rankings. Uh, so as we say uh, every year, so I will repeat it, uh, the rankings is the tip of the iceberg. It is what attracts attention. It is what will make headlines tomorrow in many uh, organs of press and the media. Uh, but we insist that the real value of the report is uh, how it is used, uh, whether it can be a tool for action to allow uh, public sector and private sector and individuals to improve their own strategies in the area of, of innovation. Uh, this being said, um, uh, the Director General already saluted the, uh, 
remarkable uh, performance of Switzerland, uh, number one for the seventh year in a row. Uh, this is all the more remarkable that Switzerland exhibits high-level performance in all the pillars of the model, and it is the only country in the world that is uh, indeed at the top uh, rankings in all of the pillars of the model, both on the output side and on the input side. Um, this, um, this year, um, we see Switzerland followed by uh, Sweden, Netherlands, uh, United States, United Kingdom. Uh, it is quite remarkable that, again, European economies would dominate the, uh, the rankings with eight European countries in the top 10 and 14 in the top uh, 20. Um, and again, there is remarkable stability at the, at the top. Uh, I was mentioned before by Sumitra, the performance of China is quite remarkable. Uh, China broke into the top 25 last year and moving again three notches this year. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the uh, two-dimensional way in which we project this data, so we don't expect anybody in this room uh, to understand and to see the details from where you are. So let me just give you an impressionistic description of this picture. It shows on the horizontal axis the income per capita, so the, uh, the richer you are, the farther you are to the right, and the vertical axis is the GII performance. So better innovators are to the top. And uh, what you, uh, the eye catches immediately is that there's a strong correlation between wealth and innovation performance. So that relates to the point also underlined by Sumitra before. There is a divide. There is a strong correlation uh, between wealth of countries and innovation performance. And this is where the global approaches to innovation uh, is particularly important. Um, what is uh, also remarkable is the, the fact that countries can be divided between those that are on top of this black regression line you see in the middle. Those are the countries that are doing better than what their GDP per capita would suggest. And those who are below this line, which means countries that still have the potential to do better with the endowment they can benefit from. So I will not get into more detail. Moving to the next slide. Um, it's difficult to uh, compare countries at different levels of development because of the correlation I mentioned before. This is why we like to actually go to a high level of granularity and to see what's happened within specific income groups. And this is the kind of picture we get. Obviously, the high income rankings reflects, for the reasons I mentioned before, the general rankings. So we have uh, Switzerland, Sweden, Netherlands there. The upper middle income uh, is a fast-moving category of, of countries with China, Bulgaria, Malaysia. Um, and uh, the lower middle income uh, is equally spectacular uh, because Vietnam, for instance, who is the, at the top in this group of countries, has one of the most spectacular progression uh, in GII this year, uh, moving up 12 ranks. Um, we still have uh, concerns about low-income countries, especially uh, Africa. Uh, at the same time, the gap has been reducing. Africa has been moving up steadily and rapidly uh, in the scale of GII, but further efforts are required both at the national level and in terms of international support for stimulating innovation in, in Africa. Uh, next slide, uh, about the, uh, the conclusions and messages coming from this year's report, especially around uh, the theme of agriculture. Uh, the first uh, message relates to the need for additional convergence. Um, clearly, uh, this stability at the top, the fact that things are moving in the middle, basically, for countries ranked between 30 and 50, uh, where we see things happening, there's still a massive challenge in addressing uh, the uh, relatively low level of convergence in terms of innovation performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, enhancing the ability of various national economies to benefit from best practices, to identify their own targets, to relate their own development plans to what can be done in the area of innovation, and basically giving more importance to what innovation can bring them is part of the effort we want to contribute to. Uh, Regarding the theme of, of this year, uh, and that will be uh, my last point, uh, it is quite symbolic that for the 10th anniversary of the GII, we have chosen the food and agriculture sector. And it's no 
coincidence. Uh, we wanted to uh, give the clear message that innovation is not just for high technology sectors. That if innovation does not change the lives of the better of the majority of mankind, uh, it's not achieving what it should be able to achieve. And there was no stronger symbol than looking at food and agriculture because it is both the most ancient activity of mankind. Uh, it is what brought groups together, uh, which is uh, uh, at the root of fundamental changes in our uh, global civilization. At the same time, uh, it is also uh, not sufficiently appreciated as an area for dramatic innovation. Uh, we tend to forget that some of the basic innovation in food and agriculture have changed geopolitics. Uh, that, for instance, the invention of refrigerator has allowed, allowed many uh, countries in Latin America to become meat exporters and uh, get better integrated uh, into uh, global, the global economy. Uh, and there are many other examples. So what we see today is that, indeed, there is a kind of innovation which is rapidly spreading, including uh, into emerging and developing countries. This is what we call digital innovation. The intensive use of drones, of satellite-based remote sensing systems, and other ways to track crops uh, and uh, better manage them, uh, especially through weather uh, systems, uh, is indeed increasing. That's what we call digital uh, agriculture. We need to stimulate an other kind of innovation through agriculture, which we call smart agriculture. And when we've put together smart and agriculture and digital innovation, then we're going to see radical changes in agriculture. Um, we are looking at a situation in which the planet, with its limited resources, will have to feed about 10 billion people. This cannot happen without significant innovation, because it has to happen against the background of minimizing pressure on the use of natural resources, including land and energy. So if we want to do it in a sustainable fashion, innovation is a key to the, uh, to the equation. And last but not least, uh, moving to uh, smart digital agriculture, which includes looking at how agricultural products are traded, uh, what kind of distortions exist in international trade for agricultural products, what kind of improvements can be made to value chains and to distribution chains, uh, all this goes far beyond technology. It has to do with organization and with the way we just uh, put our efforts together to solve this, uh, this problem. So it goes back to one fundamental message about GII, about its architecture and what about it's been trying to do for the last 10 years. That is, let's take a holistic vision of innovation. Let's consider that innovation is not just technology. It's first and foremost in a mindset. It's a mindset, it's in the minds of people. And this is where our efforts have to focus. And this is what we are trying to do. And with our partners, we hope to continue doing for another 10 years and beyond. Thank you very much, Bruno. So we have now two uh, interventions. And uh, I'm very happy to ask Mr. Volker Stack, who, as I said, is principal and leading innovation practitioner from PwC Strategy Plus to take the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. As PwC, we are committed to building trust in society and to solve important problems. Certainly, our team in this year is a very important problem to, let's say, ensure food supply for a growing population up to 10 billion by 2050 requires an increase of production output in agriculture by more than 70% over the next 30 years. This is not possible to be solved by just extending the land under cultivation. We need a different approach to innovation, a different perspective on innovation to increase total factor productivity to achieve that goal. How can innovation contribute, actually, to increase total factor productivity and to solve mankind's problems. We see that in three areas. Increasing yield, increasing total uh, physical asset productivity by making equipment more smart, and to increase and enhance sustainability of supply chains. Those three areas are very important to help feeding the world through innovation. So we see already some promising developments in certain countries where those innovations are being applied.
For instance, we see innovation in Brazil enhanced by smart technology. It's about field view platforms that help to provide real time information to farmers about using their land under cultivation, providing them information that helps them to increase yield simultaneously. Another interesting example is from Tanzania. It's about aquaculture. So Tanzania is looking for future sources of protein and innovation helps their R&D pursuits help there to identify the most suited tilapia sources for inland farming opportunities of tilapia. And Tanzania has reached out to a global community of innovators to solve this problem. Another problem, um, another example um, from a country perspective is Norway. Norway is applying deep sea drill technology from the petroleum industry to actually foster um, offshore uh, farming, salmon farming and applying technology that is used in the oil and gas industry, converting it and applying it to the production of food. And another, let's say, example is the MENA countries are really challenged by uh, water scarcity. So desalination is a challenge to access fresh water. S concentrated solar power plants can produce electricity in an efficient, um, cost-effective way and help desalination to produce fresh water. And the last example is about sustainability of supply chains. A US firm has initiated an initiative called Sustain, which tracks and monitors the sustainability of a global supply chain for dairy products and feeds, and helps to ensure sustainability through new technologies such as blockchain technology. So these are examples for specific countries where we apply already innovation, high technology, and big data analytical capabilities. Despite that progress in various countries, challenges remain. Innovation in <clears throat> agriculture is, let's say, facing long innovation adopting cycles. It takes a long time to convert. Another one is high capital requirements, and the third challenge is a reduction in public spending in R&D. So to deal with those challenges in addition, we think that collaboration between public and commercial um, entities and stakeholders makes a lot of sense and opens opportunities for innovation. Creating an ecosystem in each country to foster innovation, to set the spirit for innovation is very important. And the GII actually contributes by measuring the status quo of innovativeness, of the quality of an innovative ecosystem, and can measure progress in that regard. And our firm can help with that activity, not only measuring the innovativeness of nations, but also of the stakeholders, companies, industries in those um, countries by measuring their performance with benchmarking, real-time data, and uh, capability building. It's not about how much you spend on innovation, actually, but it's about how you innovate and how an innovation ecosystem can be built. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stapp. Uh, it's now my pleasure to give the floor to our last uh, intervener uh, from our side, and that's Mr. Noshet Forbes, the immediate past president of the Confederation of Indian Industry. Please, Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Gurry. Uh, Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you at the launch of the 10th edition of the Global Innovation Index. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Confederation of Indian Industry, uh, we've been pleased to be partners with uh, WIPO and uh, NCAD for many years in bringing the Global Innovation Index out, uh, and uh, especially happy to uh, be with you at this uh, 10th anniversary launch. Uh, the importance of innovation and technical change in the development of the world uh, is very well understood. Uh, as you all know, it's contributed to over half of all economic growth uh, for over the last 200 years. Uh, that's uh, directly led to uh, many countries moving ahead and becoming wealthier countries in the world. Uh, and it is indeed the, uh, the task of uh, all of the emerging world uh, to use innovation uh, as its own driver of economic growth and its own driver of economic catch-up. 
at the launch of the Global Innovation Index in <coughs> Delhi last year, uh, you know, in, in innovation is receiving uh, a lot more attention in India, probably more attention in India today uh, than it has ever received before. Uh, at the launch of the Global Innovation Index uh, a year ago, <coughs> less than a year ago in Delhi, uh, the, uh, uh, the function that we had then uh, prompted our Minister for Commerce and Industry to set up an innovation task force. Uh, and the focus of that task force was really uh, not on the Global Innovation Index and what one can do in the Global Innovation Index, but on how one can indeed improve the context for innovation broadly in the country uh, itself. Uh, we've now taken it further. Uh, we've now launched uh, uh, an effort to try and create a state innovation index which will, uh, which will foster competition between Indian states uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in competing one with the other uh, to improve their own climate for innovation. Uh, so much progress uh, in many parts of the world, much progress certainly uh, in India, um, but I think uh, uh, the more progress we make, uh, the more there is to do. Uh, our previous Prime Minister Manmohan Singh used, was fond of saying that uh, India is a country that lives in all centuries at once. And that's actually very true. Uh, when you drive around India, when you visit India, you see the diversity of the country, you see the complexity of the country unfold in front of your eyes. And our development challenge uh, is to actually live in fewer centuries at once, uh, to have more and more of our population included in the growth process, uh, to have more and more of the country indeed converge uh, on the advantages and the uh, and the and the, and the lifestyles that come from that come from a, a more affluent existence, that's what innovation has to deliver for us as a country, and uh, that's the challenge that we have. We have two specific areas of focus within the Confederation of Indian Industry that we've been advancing in this last uh, year or so as a part of the <coughs> national innovation agenda. First is to increase the amount of R&D that we do in industry. Uh, Indian industry invests about 0.3% uh, of GDP in R&D. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's rising, but it's still very small relative to global levels. The world average is 1.5%, uh, so we need to scale our investments within industry in R&D by a factor of five to match global levels. Second, Within higher education, most, most of the world does public research, publicly funded research in the higher education sector. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the global average is about 0.4% uh, of global GDP is, uh, is invested in uh, public research done within the higher education sector. In India, it's 0.04%. So we need to scale our investments within of public research done within the higher education sector by a factor of 10. These are our two challenges and our two immediate priorities. How do we greatly increase the investment of R&D by firms? Uh, how do we greatly increase the investment of public research in our higher education system? It's not that the Indian government doesn't invest in public research, but this public research has tended to be done in autonomous R&D institutes, as in many other countries, but which have now moved away from that model. Uh, but we need to do much more of our public research within the higher education system. I'll make a couple of comments, if I may, about, uh, uh, about the Global Innovation Index itself and how we could take it forward. The great attraction of the Global Innovation Index is that it does provide an assessment of the broad context of innovation by looking at the kinds of metrics that Shumitra and Bruno talked about just now, by looking at uh, uh, five uh, input indicators, uh, five sets of input indicators and two sets of output indicators. But the very nature of setting out to measure such a broad context of innovation uh, has its own challenges uh, because we need to in some cases rely, uh, for example, on perceptions as opposed to on objective indicators. And I welcome the fact that we've tried in the Innovation Index over the years to move to more and more objective indicators and away from perceptions, which I think is a very healthy, a very healthy thing, because perceptions, as you all know, uh, are really a product of, of, uh, of fashion very often, 
uh, and of, uh, and of uh, what one has read in the newspapers in the last month uh, as, a res as, as opposed to something much more substantive and real. Uh, so I would, I would suggest that we keep that process moving along, of moving to more and more objective indicators. And for example, when we try and measure political stability, uh, instead of measuring, asking people what they think about stability, uh, maybe we can use some kind of an objective measure like you know, changes, constitutional, you know, the, 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 the number of constitutional changes in, in the government in the last 25 years, uh, something that would be a more objective way of getting at those <coughs> kinds of issues. Second, uh, if one looks at the efficiency with which research is done, or the way in which, uh, within the higher education sector, for example, uh, can one not only measure the amount, the number of publications that come out of the higher education system, but perhaps also an efficiency metric that looks at the number of publications per billion dollars spent uh, on research in the higher education system. Third, uh, can we look at some measures around the vibrancy of a particular market? For example, change in the top 100 firms uh, in a particular country uh, might, be, uh, might be a useful indicator uh, of dynamism and change in the market on an ongoing basis. Uh, in the press conference that we just had before this session, there were questions about, uh, uh, about the US and its ranking and so on uh, post, post uh, the recent election. Um, and uh, I think if one tries to come up with some metrics that reflect the openness of economies, openness to ideas, openness to immigration, openness to movement of people, uh, these kinds of metrics which we know are associated with strong innovation performance uh, would be valuable metrics to put in place as objective indicators of these kinds of, these kinds of phenomena that could, be, that could have a very long-term impact uh, impact on countries. You know, the, uh, in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is, is, is known, as you know, to be the heart of the IC industry, and someone once told me that IC stood for Indians and Chinese. Uh, a, a, last, a last suggestion on the metrics um, the, uh, uh, is, is, again, if, when one looks at ICT performance, perhaps one can also look at the, uh, the presence of ICT professionals uh, in, a, in, 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 the total, in the total workforce. So for all of these reasons with metrics, I've always found the Global Innovation Index to be a very useful and powerful publication, but I found it particularly useful, not so much necessarily for the rankings, uh, but for the qualitative insights that it provides, for the direction it provides on how one can improve one's own innovation performance as a country. And I think if we keep coming back to those broader contexts of development that we need to achieve in our countries, if we keep coming back to uh, the specific objectives that we have in India at present of increasing investment in R&D, in firms, and in our higher education system, I think there's much in the report that tells us how we can go about this, and that's an extremely valuable contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Forbes. So, uh, may I turn the floor over now to you um, for anyone who would like to ask a question or certainly make a statement or uh, uh, make any observations, any commentaries. So, um, we have a couple who have indicated previously that they would wish to speak, and um, if I may, uh, in the absence of anyone else, I'll call upon, uh, first of all, Janis Karklans, the Ambassador of Latvia. Please, here yeah, before. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Dutta and, and uh, uh, Ms. Lana for uh, this um, uh, fundamental work. I, I think uh, every country is waiting annually this publication for the for the reasons that that uh, very eloquently Ms. Ms. Forbes described. It is a is a good source of uh, 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 let's say inspiration for uh, reflection, domestic reflection. I would I would offer a thought that for us uh, innovation is very uh, intimately linked with the uh, competitiveness of uh, national economy and as we know humans are very competitive by nature so and uh, 
uh, the, the competitiveness drives investments, investments drives production, and, and then well-being of our population. So this, this is a kind of a, uh, ecosystem that is very uh, useful to understand in order to fine-tune and improve uh, on on annual basis. So therefore, we're very grateful for your for your effort and, and your work, and we hope that uh, uh, we will see a centenary edition of this uh, uh, in index in <coughs> uh, 2107. Uh, but jokes apart, so uh, thank you, and please keep uh, doing this work. Uh, good good work for uh, benefit of all of us. Thank you. We'll need a lot of innovation for some of us to see in the centenary edition. <laughs> um, Ambassador John of Vietnam, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, express our sincere thanks to you uh, for inviting us to a very important uh, briefing and launching of the Global Innovation Index uh, 2017. This is the first time uh, that I attend this uh, and uh, it's very, I'm very glad that Vietnam also uh, has mentioned as uh, uh, the first uh, in uh, low middle income con countries for innovation. So uh, we are very happy also that over the last 10 years, the GII has already been widely recognized as a recognized tool for action for countries and uh, decision makers worldwide, uh, drawing uh, in, in its uh, identification of uh, their policy for faster environment conducive to I innovation. And of course, like uh, uh, all the panelists already stress, uh, the most important thing is not only the problem, <coughs> but also uh, to, to, to look through indicators and countries can, uh, can, can you know, improve or country can, can, can put emphasis in, in such and every indicators for their uh, economies uh, can fit uh, competitiveness as well as the the innovation um, policy. Uh, really, uh, our government uh, of Vietnam we are touched in recent years the great importance to innovation, and the Prime Minister of Vietnam stressed in every session of the government that innovation must be present in uh, you know uh, in efforts uh, to. Uh, uh, to uh, you know, to, to enhance the competitiveness of the country, and we command also that the theme for uh, this uh, uh, global uh, innovation index for this year is uh, concentrating <coughs> on agriculture and food, because uh, we, we we think that uh, facing with climate change, facing with challenges uh, of uh, uh, environmental uh, challenges. We think that if we, we, we can have more innovation R&D in this issue, and mostly with low-income countries like Vietnam, uh, we can uh, provide also uh, growth and uh, competitiveness uh, since uh, from last year uh, in nationwide. Uh, we, launch, or we have launched also uh, the campaign for industrialization of agriculture. So we, 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 we put basically uh, innovation as also in a very important po uh, uh, place in, in, in the uh, nationwide efforts. And uh, of course, uh, uh, thanks to also to the uh, WIPO uh, capacity building project and program, uh, we have raised the uh, GII, uh, raising awareness of GII, the importance of innovation uh, for, uh, for all other, uh, you know, all stakeholders uh, in the countries. And we have also many comp competitions uh, uh, in the, all routes, uh, all layers of uh, the population. Uh, so, and, and, and even uh, some agriculture can have uh, their own uh, creativity, their own creation for their own work. So, uh, and, and, and they have been already, uh, you know, deserved also trophies and, and medals uh, from in their own innovation of the uh, WIPO. So we, we, we think that really uh, this uh, uh, GII process, uh, G GII uh, reports and also um, for, for several years and uh, have already a very positive impact in, in the 
uh, you know, in, in the strengthening of the capacity and competitiveness uh, of the economy uh, for Vietnam. So uh, we, we, we think that we can, uh, can have uh, uh, this also with us uh, in the, uh, the process of uh, development of, uh, of our economy. Now, uh, of course, uh, for the ranking of Vietnam, uh, you see that we, we have jumped, uh, according to the, the indicators, we have jumped even 12th uh, grade uh, from, last, uh, the, from the 2015, uh, 16, we, we have been ranked uh, 90, uh, 59 and now 47. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite a, a big jump. But uh, how, you know, we have to study also and we have also uh, to, to discuss with other uh, partners and uh, so, so that we can sustain. How to, to sustain it? Because, uh, you know, every age and every year maybe we can jump up, <coughs> jump down, you know, and, 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 and go down. So how, you know, of course this is our efforts and of course it is our policy, but uh, we, we can exchange also views and experience and lesson learned and how, how we can, uh, can do to, to sustain and to improve. Of course, this is our duty, our responsibility, but we, we can have the organization and we can have also other, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders to, to help, uh, to discuss, to share views, experience. And we, we think that uh, from, from now on, after the, this launching, uh, the organization can have also some fora uh, to, to exchange from uh, uh, top ranking and you know middle ranking and and uh, you know uh, other uh, uh, economies, so that we can exchange views and we can learn each other. So thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Rang. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, if I may, um, Ambassador El Zabi of the United Emir Arab Emirates, followed by uh, Switzerland, Ambassador Zelweger. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, Mr. Francis Gary, Director General of Waibu, for conveying this briefing. And I would like to thank as well both editors of the Global Innovation Index, Mr. Sumetra Dutta from Cornell University and Mr. Bruno Lamben from NCIAD for their report to presentation of the 10th edition of Global Innovation Index GII 2017. The United Arab Emirates believe that its achievement in this year, Global Innovation Index, is another proof that the strategy followed by the UAE government is a successful and sound. This strategy has adopted innovation as a significant pillar to provide solution and put forward initiatives. Since the innovation year in 2015, the United Arab Emirates launched its national innovation strategy as part of UAE Vision 2021 which encourages a new thinking and groundbreaking solution in seven priority sectors, renewable and clean energy, transportation, technology, education, health, water, and space. In this sector, UAE is taking an innovative approach to address 21st century challenge. According to this year, GII, the UAE ranked the first among Arab countries for the second consecutive year and the 35th worldwide in terms of overall performance on this uh, index, up from 41st globally in 2016. The 2017 GII mainly focuses on innovation in agriculture and food system and indicates UAE as the number one in providing the environment of innovation in the Arab world. I would like to seize this opportunity uh, to express the UAE highest appreciation for the tremendous efforts made to measure innovation and its valuable contribution to the national innovative policy. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So I now have the pleasure in handing the floor to the world champions, the gold medalist and Ambassador Zilbega. Thank you very much. That is an introduction we don't often have. <laughs> Certainly not in sports except for tennis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director General. Thank you, all of you who were involved in the drafting of uh, this uh, very important report. Mr. Forbes has indicated that in India, innovation as a phenomenon, as a driver of economic growth, 
growth has only relatively recently come to the forefront. I think this applies to most of us, uh, at least the non-experts. Um, innovation as a driver of economic growth has come to our attention about 10, 15 years ago, which is the time span of the GII. And I think the GII, in, in the meantime, has established itself as the one instrument that gives us the analytical tools to better understand. You have indicated that innovation is important because it's such a key driver for economic growth. And it's perhaps often forgotten that Switzerland is to a certain extent, an illustration of that. We forget that Switzerland, 150 years ago, was a, one of the poorer countries in Western Europe, was a country of emigration, a country of famines. And uh, innovation certainly has uh, played a key role also in our economic uh, development, given the fact that we do not have a lot of <coughs> natural resources. So, to a certain extent, the fact that today we're in a good position uh, is certainly, I think, also uh, based on a common knowledge of the need of uh, innovation uh, for economic development. And that brings me to my question, and I would like to join my colleague from Vietnam. The most important factor for us, because you indicate the importance of governments for setting um, the, the, the frame for sound um, uh, innovation systems. What, in your view, are the most important factor for us is less the, the ranking, because rankings, as we all know, are unfortunately volatile, although, as you have indicated, they were stable over the past seven years. That doesn't foresee anything uh, on the future. What are the lessons to be learned? How can we sustain or build on our systems of uh, economic, uh, of uh, innovation? And that would be probably really the key issue. Are there any main um, indicators? Um, you have shown us the, uh, uh, the different factors for input factor and output, but are there some indicators or some measures that can be taken that have a, a more important impact than others and that those who are in a good position should take care of and others who may wish to uh, go up in the rankings that they should uh, have a closer look at. Thank you, and thank you again for the index. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Just before I ask the panelists to address your question, are there any other um, <coughs> ambassadors that may wish to take the floor? And yes, please, please. Yeah. Um. Definitely not an ambassador yet, but thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, speaking on behalf of Israel, I wanted to Thank you all very much for this important and comprehensive report. We welcome it very much. We think that this is a key feature of the global innovation um, academic literature, and I think this is extremely useful as a tool for peer learning, how we can all really learn from each other about creating a more innovative global economy. And we welcome the fact that the focus of this year's report was about agriculture and food technology, we think that this is critical, especially coming from the MENA region, where this is not just a matter of prosperity, this is really a question of survival. And these technologies really can help bring forth further prosperity for many people. We are also very happy to see that Israel's rankings have continued to climb up, which is a result of very dedicated government policies and entrepreneurship in the private sector. We're particularly happy with the fact that our R&D results are top of the rankings um, in light of the global decline. And we think that this is a very important part of the fact that we have been able to rank so high because of research and development and investment in this field. We think that this is very important. Likewise, as um, the Honorable Ambassador for uh, Switzerland noted, Israel does not have many natural resources. And innovation is really a foundation of our economic growth and prosperity. And we think that this can really be used as a tool for other countries, particularly when trying to overcome the innovation divide. We think that this is very important and I would also perhaps like to address the question and ask from this report some of the key findings that you have seen from those countries that have managed to climb up many, many steps from the lower income countries or from the middle income countries and overcoming those economic obstacles to create more innovative technologies and um, economies. How do they overcome this 
innovative divide, innovation divide. <coughs> and thank you very much again for this report. It's very, very interesting to read. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll stop there. Yes, I know we have two more, if I may, and then we'll go on to ask the panelists' views about the, the uh, questions raised. Uh, Ambassador of uh, Mongolia, first of all. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to join my colleagues and, uh, uh, in uh, congratulating the launch of this uh, current report. And uh, we also... Uh, happy to see that uh, our ranking has climbed up and uh, we are on the top three in, uh, uh, in the group of uh, uh, lower uh, middle income countries and uh, uh, concerning the uh, the content of the uh, global innovation index of this year we are happy to note that the priority is uh, set to very uh, uh, a very good priority is set on food issue and also uh, there was a mentioning of the uh, water issue and innovation in uh, uh, resolving the scarcity of water and yeah so uh, I think the uh, the uh, the focus is uh, very good and it's especially it's relevant to all of us including the developing and uh, developing countries who face uh, uh, more uh, the effects of climate change in that sense, I would also encourage to, to continue also exchange of uh, uh, experiences among countries, how they so, uh, solve the, uh, uh, the issues of uh, uh, scarcity of uh, water in, uh, and the issue of how they address the environmental uh, issues and also how they uh, create, how they bring, bring uh, uh, smart solutions in agricultural production and uh, uh, that would be good in, uh, to organize among, among stakeholders and uh, member states a uh, experience, experience sharing and competitiveness in these two uh, sectors. And also I would like to note that uh, in Mongolia we have been uh, continuously encouraging innovation both by policy and also at the uh, trying to uh, uh, encourage the academics and the research institutions and private sector to come up with uh, more uh, innovation, even if it's uh, if it's uh, uh, a, a gradual innovation. And uh, the, uh, I would like also to note that the capacity building and uh, encouragement from the WIPO was also crucial in that in, in this uh, endeavor. And, uh, Thank you again for the report. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. We have our last uh, intervention, and um, then I'll uh, we'll conclude with each of the panelists addressing the two uh, questions, in particular Switz uh, Switzerland and Israel, about key factors or ingredients of success. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Director General. Uh, I'm also not uh, an ambassador, so I'll join my Israeli colleague and make a statement. I'll we are first I'd like to thank you very much uh, for the presentation today. Uh, the importance of the work was underlined by many other uh, uh, speakers as well as you, Mr. Director General. Uh, of course, uh, you also made a reference to the limits of the indicator in uh, generalizing uh, the, the, the results that were achieved in any case. They show interesting trends and they feed back in our national or re regional debate. Uh, on the policies to support innovation and strengthen the, the, the general economic growth. Now, the, the, res the main subject of the agricultural sector today is uh, very much in Brazil's interest. We have seen the ambassador of Vietnam mention the, the importance re with regard to climate change. Also, the, the delegate from Israel mentioned the, the, the relevance for them. But in the case of Brazil, even as we have uh, many natural resources, the innovation in the agriculture sector is a key uh, factor in uh, uh, increasing our productivity and allowing us to be uh, major exporters in a lot of uh, agricultural products. We also uh, have the pleasure of seeing that the report mentioned the sustainable development uh, goals of the United Nations. We commend very much uh, this uh, mission and we see the, the efforts of WIPO to, to address this in its internal activity. Now, also, uh, 
apart from the national regional uh, debates that we may use uh, uh, the Global Innovation Index, it could be also be useful to guide uh, WIPO's activities, not only with the reference to technical assistance, but also in designing policies to support uh, national regional efforts. So one example that I'd like to mention is the, the case of universities. Uh, we see that they have a lot of importance in, in, in all countries, but this is especially so in the case of developing countries. So perhaps so this could uh, lead us to discussion on how WIPO could uh, uh, support those efforts. For instance, at the PCT level, we had a, a proposal on uh, uh, for, uh, providing a fee reductions to further stimulate the innovation by the, the universities from developing countries. So we see a lot of merit in the global innovation. I'd like to thank you again, and also the, your colleagues at the podium for this presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my apologies, a slight modification. I know we're running short of time, but I omitted our colleague, our good colleague from the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, please, you have the floor. I think that's me, thank you very much. Um, well, I would first of all like, like to thank the, the whole GII team on behalf uh, also of my, my colleagues at FAO uh, for the opportunity that we could contribute a chapter to, to this year's Global Innovation Index. Uh, it was a really good collaboration. And uh, many of the speakers, they, they have stressed already um, the importance of innovation, in particular in the agricultural sector. And we think also that realizing the potential of innovation in agriculture is, is very crucial in the context uh, of the, the 2030 agenda also. Um, we think that there's an increased need, however, to understand um, innovation as a process that really emerges from collective learning and, and action, and also to, to meaningfully combine um, technological, social, and institutional innovations. Um, now, FAO um, at the moment is really stepping up its efforts uh, to support its member countries in, on the one hand, assessing their innovation systems, their agricultural innovation systems, but also in then developing these systems. Um, in February 2018, there will be a global uh, symposium that will focus on, on agricultural innovation for smallholder farmers uh, that will be held in Rome. And it should be a unique opportunity to engage policymakers in, in this uh, topic and um, to discuss uh, ways how to best develop national agricultural innovation strategies also. And having said that, uh, we look forward uh, to continue the collaboration uh, with the Global Innovation Index. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So now a final word addressing the, I think, very similar questions, if I may say, from Switzerland and Israel. Um, on what are the key factors, what are the lessons learned, what are the ingredients of success, what makes that one country move or successful uh, in its innovation capacity and performance. And if I may, I'll just start from the far right, Mr. Stuck. Yeah, I think one success factor in, in innovativeness is the customer connection and to what extent the um, innovation strategies of uh, stakeholders in the country, organizations, public and commercial organizations, to what extent their innovation strategies are combined and linked to their overall strategy. This is important and to, let's say, be prepared for the big change from product to software innovation. We will see a big swing towards software innovation and this requires different capabilities. So a success factor would be to prepare country's education system to deal with this challenge acquiring new talent, educating new talent to develop more software innovation rather than product innovation. Another success factor is globalization of R&D. Our research shows that more dispersed innovation footprints, R&D footprints are more successful than concentrated in one country. And the innovativeness of a nation invades actually, invites actually innovators from global companies to uh, put their footprint into different nations to compete and collaborate on the innovation side. Thank you very much, uh, Samita. So I'll be very brief. On the basis of results from the innovation research we're conducting, I would highlight two. First of all, there's a very strong need for national strategy and innovation. So almost all countries that we see moving up, there is a focus at the national level of focus on innovation very strongly. Second is, it's like a chain. You need to focus on multiple aspects. Innovation is not just done by opening one research center somewhere. 
you have good human capital, you need good infrastructure, you need good market sophistication, good businesses. It's like links in a chain. If one link doesn't work properly, the whole thing doesn't work or it doesn't work as well. And that's the hard part of innovation. Why is innovation hard? Is because to do all these things consistently well. And that's one reason why Switzerland actually is among the countries that, that does it actually quite well. Uh, thank you very much, Bruno Lorraine. Yes, yeah, very quickly about uh, how to make uh, a good performance sustainable. Uh, there are things you don't want to do and things you want to do. Uh, a thing you don't want to do is stop and go. Um, there's ample evidence in the GII and uh, elsewhere that uh, investing you know, in a brutal fashion in innovation and stopping it the following year, even to resume it five years ago, does not give the results you can hope for. So such efforts have to be typically longer term. Uh, they have to involve civil society in a way that makes them sustainable. Even if there is an election, a change in government, the effort needs to be sustained. That's a critical element. The second one is that, uh, as we often mention in these discussions and elsewhere, innovation and first and foremost a mindset. Uh, your greatest uh, wealth for sustaining a high performance innovation is to entertain this, this mindset, to keep it where it should be. Uh, that means involving younger generation, getting new ideas, being flowed in uh, all the time to keep it. And it also means a strong connection between innovation strategies and culture. You cannot invent an innovation strategy in a sector and activity that does not relate somehow to what your particular country, your particular society has been about. Whether it's in mathematics, in medicine, in arts, there is always something deep, which is worth considering as deep roots for, for innovation. And last but not least, um, openness is key. Uh, we live in a global economy. Uh, this will not go away. And protectionist tendencies, tendencies to build walls rather than bridges will run against innovation. Uh, thank you very much, Bruno. No set forms, please. Uh, if I could try to address the question from the perspective of what innovation literature has said. I think innovation literature would say that if you're trying to catch up, then you worry about technical change, but you worry especially about social capital. And if you invest strongly in social capital, then you actually provide that base for rapid catch up. And indeed, the example that you gave of Switzerland being a poor country 150 years ago, uh, the, the, what, what the economic history, I think, shows is that Switzerland and Scandinavia catched up, uh, caught up extremely rapidly because they had very high levels of social capital combined with relatively poor, uh, yeah, poor per capita GDP at the time. And the, the, same, the same, I think, was true of Japan at the, at, at the time. So I think for all of us who are developing countries, we need to worry about social capital, we need to worry about education systems, about investment, first in primary education, second in secondary, third in higher, but in that sequence, uh, and then worry about research. Uh, if one is already a rich country, if then the challenge is staying ahead. How do you actually stay ahead? I think the, uh, the, 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 the innovation literature would say, look at innovation as an evolutionary process, uh, look at adaptability, how does one enable one to be as adaptive as a society to changes that are taking place, and adaptability requires then a great deal of experimentation. So it almost surely says, don't try to pick winners, don't try to pick which technologies will actually be the winners in the future. Instead, try to invest very widely across the whole spectrum of different technologies and let the market decide which are the winners uh, in, 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 the, in, in the future. So see technology as, an, as an, an innovation, as an evolutionary process, and see experimentation and adaptability as the, as the heart of that engine of progress. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we do have to vacate the room. So thank you very much for your presence here uh, this morning, and we'll close on that point. Thank you.